Hey folks, Edda from Brain Pulp TV, and as of this recording, the pre-release weekend for Throne of Eldraine, the newest expansion from Magic the Gathering, is well underway. And as is the case with all the pre-release weekends, the new Planeswalker decks have been unleashed into the wild and are currently for sale at countless local gaming stores all over the world. This time around, the new decks up for offer are the White Red Rowan Fearless Spark Mage deck, as well as Oko the Trickster's Blue Green deck. Now in this video, I'm gonna be cracking one of these Planeswalker deck boxes open to show you what you can expect to find inside. After that, I'll be giving you an overview of the deck itself, which will include me going over every single card in it. Then I'll be opening up a couple booster packs of Throne of Eldraine, and finally, I'll be finishing things off with my closing thoughts on the deck. Now, before I get into it, two quick things. One, if you've already seen the other Throne of Eldraine Planeswalker deck video, you may want to skip to the deck overview part, which you can find at the time code listed to the right of the screen. The reason being is that up until that point, I'll be covering a lot of the same ground in this video that I did in the previous video. And two, if you are completely new to Planeswalker decks and or Magic in general, and you want to know more about what exactly this product is, you might want to check out the first few minutes of my Corset 2020 Chandra Flames Fury Overview slash opening video, as I kick off that video with a fairly thorough What Are Planeswalker Decks segment. In fact, to make it easier for you, there will be a link appearing on screen right now that can take you to that video, or if you prefer, I'll also be providing a link in the description below. However, for the rest of you, it is time to crack open one of these boxes like a cardboard filled pinata to find out what's inside. And in this video, we'll be opening up the Rowan Fearless Spark Mage deck. Now, to be perfectly honest, the contents of these boxes don't really change much from expansion to expansion. In fact, they haven't really changed much at all since they were first released back in Kaladesh, so I'm guessing there's not much here that will surprise most of you. Still, every deck could be someone's first deck, so it's best to go over everything in the box anyways. First and foremost, we have the nice shiny foil planeswalker that is exclusive to the deck, meaning you won't find this card in regular packs of Throne of Eldraine. Now, I'll be talking more in depth about the planeswalker later on in the video, so let's just set it aside for now and get to the next item you'll find inside which is the deck box. Some things to note here, this box features different artwork than you'll find on your Planeswalker. It also has the name of the Planeswalker on the side of the box, as well as the Planeswalker symbol on the back. Most importantly though, this box will fit your 60 card deck even after it's been sleeved up in standard size protective sleeves. However, that is about the max capacity, so for those of you who may want to build a 15 card sideboard to go with the deck, sadly you'll have to find a roomier solution than what you have here. Now, opening up this box, you'll find all the other goodies that are included with your Planeswalker deck, including the deck itself. Now, much like with the Planeswalker, I'll be talking more about this as well as a few extra insert cards that come along with it later on in the video. So let's set this aside for now and get on to the next item, which just so happens to be these two packs of Throne of Eldraine, which I'm already itching to tear open. However, all good things come to those who wait, and sadly, we're gonna have to wait a little bit longer to do that. And last, but also probably least, we've got the Hey Before You Play foldout. Now, these used to provide you with a full deck list. However, they did away with that about a year or so ago. So now they give you a bit of lore about your Planeswalker, a short blurb about the deck, and some info on the various keywords and or mechanics you'll find on some of the cards. Then on the back, it gives you some basic information about Planeswalkers, including loyalty counters and how to use them. Nothing too in-depth, mind you, but still, it could be rather useful for newer players. And that's pretty much everything that comes with your Planeswalker deck. So now it's time to rip the wrapper off this sucker, but before we get into the playable cards, let's go over the three inserts you'll find at the back here. First up, we have a card that breaks down the order of play on your turn. Now, this information used to come in the form of a foldout that explained this in a bit more detail. However, I personally think this card does a fine job of doing almost the exact same thing. In fact, I kind of like this version a bit better, as it's much more compact, which is nice for anyone who might want to use this as a crib sheet while they're playing. Then, on the back of this card, you're given a brief rundown of the ins and outs of both attacking and blocking, which goes well with the info on the next card you're going to see, which talks about the power and toughness of your creatures, as well as some info on how combat damage works. Moving right along, you'll find a copy of the On an Adventure token. Now, this is new to Throne of Eldraine, and it's meant to be used as sort of a designated waiting room for cards with adventure spells that you've cast during the game. Now, for those of you who don't know what an adventure spell is, don't worry, I'm going to be going over those when I do my deck overview. Anyway, this token is by no means necessary for you to play adventures, but I still kind of like the fact that Wizards included this in the deck instead of making the back of this card just like an advertisement or something. I think it's a nice touch. And last, but certainly not least, you'll find your deck's Magic Arena code, which you can redeem on your Magic Arena account for a digital copy of this deck. Keep in mind though, you can only use this code once. So if you share the code with someone else, you won't be able to use it for yourself later on if they've already cashed it in on their account. Now I've said this in previous videos, but it's worth saying again, this is something I hope Wizards doesn't just keep doing, but also expands on as well. 
And by that, I mean, so far, they've just done this with the Planeswalker decks, but I really hope these types of codes will be included in all future standard legal decks, like Challenger decks or the soon to be released Brawl decks as well, too. In fact, for non-standard legal decks like Commander products, maybe throw Magic Online a bone and include these codes so that they can work on that platform. That would, at the very least, I think, be a nice gesture towards a group of players who, at this point, probably feel kind of abandoned, given all the love and attention that's been sent Arena's way over the past year or so. But that's a topic for a whole other video. Anyways, now that we've covered everything else, let's get to talking about the deck. But before we do, just one note. Planeswalker decks are geared towards newer and or casual players. The power level of these decks make it so that they will never really compete with Challenger decks, or for the most part, any deck that's currently being played in even a semi-competitive environment. So during this overview, if I ever say a card is especially good or powerful, I'm doing so while looking through the lens of a Planeswalker deck, meaning I am comparing it to and assuming it will be matched up against other Planeswalker decks. Okay, so now that we've got that disclaimer out of the way, let's get to it. The Rowan Fearless Spark Mage deck is, at its core, a weenie-style aggro deck, meaning it utilizes a large number of small, low-cost creatures to try to flood the board and overwhelm your opponent early in the game in the hopes that by the time they can rally the fence, it's already too late. And on top of that, it also has a strong knight tribal theme to it, where most of the cards are either knights themselves or specifically benefit knights in some way. In fact, only four cards in the whole deck make absolutely no reference to knights whatsoever. And even then, most of those are still quite useful in some other way, whether it be in the form of removal or something that can pump up your other creatures. And speaking of that last effect, there are several ways available to you in this deck to pump up your creatures, both till the end of turn and in more permanent ways. And you'll find that those pump effects can be especially effective when you use them on some of your creatures that have first strike. However, when faced against blockers that you still can't crash through even when your army is all pumped up, your best bet is to either evade them with flying, or better yet, lock them down with tap abilities. And given the fact that you only have one creature in your entire deck with a power above three, at some point you will probably need to do just that. Especially since that creature's base toughness is only two, which means unless you're able to knock out your opponent early, you may find yourself facing a board full of blockers later in the game that can easily shut down your attackers. And if you don't have an answer to that situation already in play, you can have a hard time finding one on the quick, because the closest thing you have to extra card draw in this deck is a single copy of a claimed contender. Alrighty, now that I've gone over the basic ins and outs of the deck, let's get a bit more specific by going over each individual card. I'll start with the Planeswalker and other exclusive cards, then move on to the creatures, followed by the adventure cards, and then finish things off with the non-creature spells. Oh, and the land, of course, as well, too, but in these decks, that's mostly just basic land anyways. So, kicking things off, we've got Rowan Fearless Spark Mage. For 3 and 2 red, you get a 5 loyalty planeswalker. The plus 1 ability is up to 1 target creature, gets plus 3, plus 0, and gains first strike into the end of turn. Minus 2, she deals 1 damage to up to 2 target creatures. Those creatures can't block this turn. And the minus 9 ability, gain control of all creatures until the end of turn. Untap them, they gain haste until the end of turn. So, in a deck like this, which is filled with creatures, especially smaller creatures, which usually have a bit of trouble sort of swinging in against larger blocks, Blockers, being able to give something plus three attack is great. Being able to do that along with first strike is really good. And then of course there's the minus two ability. Being able to deal damage to your opponent's creatures is always good, even if it's only one point of damage. But making it so those creatures can't block, that is really good once again, especially in this deck where a lot of your creatures are smaller. You can pump some of them up, but even then you're still going to end up trading with a lot of blockers. So this is really going to clear the way for a lot of your creatures to swing in, even if they're not the toughest creatures on the board. And then, of course, the minus nine ultimate ability is is great. I mean, it's it's wonderful, especially if you're playing another Planeswalker deck because they're usually creature based. So chances are this is going to be a nice little swing for you. But keep in mind, she starts at five loyalty. You need nine to be able to cast this particular loyalty ability. That means she has to be on the battlefield for four turns, just getting plus ones and then an additional turn after that to actually use this. So chances are you're never going to be able to use the ultimate. Still, it's a fun little ability if you ever do get to use it. Oh, and one a final note about her, she does cost 5 to get into play, which is kind of unusual for Planeswalker deck Planeswalkers. A lot of the time they cost 6, so she actually has a slightly better cost than a lot of the other Planeswalker deck Planeswalkers, at least the ones that I can remember off the top of my head. Okay, now that we're done talking about the Planeswalker, let's get to the other exclusive cards, starting with the Tudor card from this particular deck. It is Rowan's Stalwarts. So for 4 and 1 red, you get a 5-2 Human Knight with, whenever it enters the battlefield, you may search your library and or graveyard for a card named Rowan Fearless Spark Mage, reveal it, put it into your hand. If you search your library this way, shuffle it. So pretty much all of the Planeswalker decks, other than the 2019 Corset Planeswalker decks, have a tutor card like this, which allows you to search your library and or graveyard for your Planeswalker and put it into your hand. 
So what this card does is sort of make up for the fact that you only have one copy of Planeswalker in your deck. So even if it goes into your graveyard, you can still cast it again later in the game. I've never been a big fan of the Planeswalker deck tutors that are just creatures that enter the board and don't have any extra abilities. And really, other than the fact that this particular creature has the highest attack power of all the other creatures in your deck, there's really nothing special about it. Oh, and one final note about this is its casting cost is five. Now, a lot of the times the tutor cards cost one less to cast than your Planeswalker, but remember, Rowan actually costs five as well. Now, I'm not exactly sure why they decided to work the costs of those two cards this way, but I kind of like it because at least this way you know if you cast your tutor card in one turn, you're definitely going to be able to cast your Planeswalker on the following turn, even if you don't draw another land. However, I still don't think that makes it for the the fact that it's really just a vanilla creature once it hits the board and doesn't really do anything special afterwards. Next up, we have four copies of the common exclusive card in the deck, and that is Garrison Griffin. For two and one white, you get a 2-2 Griffin with flying, and whenever it attacks, target knight you control gains flying until the end of turn. Now, by no means is this a game-changing card, but it does have some uses in this deck. It's going to allow one of your smaller creatures to fly overhead of your opponent's blockers and get in for a bit of extra damage. And if you match this with something like the Red Cap Raiders, which has low toughness but can be pumped up, it can actually be quite valuable. And now we have the final exclusive card in the deck, which is three copies of Rowan's Battle Guard. This uncommon costs three and two red for a 3-3 Human Knight with First Strike, and as long as you control a Rowan Planeswalker, Rowan's Battle Guard gets plus three, plus zero. Now a 3-3 for four mana isn't very good, but a 3-3 with First Strike can be quite good. It can usually swing in during times where you normally wouldn't be able to because first strike can really swing things your way during combat. As well too, if Rowan is already on the battlefield, all of a sudden this creature now becomes the most powerful card in your deck, at least the most powerful creature as far as attack power goes. So yeah, of the exclusive creatures in this deck, this is definitely my favorite. Moving on now from the exclusive cards, let's start talking about the other creatures in this deck. And we're gonna do this in the order of converted mana cost, starting with Venerable Knight. Now, roughly a million years ago in Magic, a 2-1 for one white was actually a rare card, and it was Savannah Lions. Since then, the power level of a 2-1 for one isn't considered quite as impressive as it used to be. So a lot of the times now, they'll add some sort of extra ability to it, like they have here. Now, granted, the ability for Venerable Knight to put a plus one, plus one counter on another creature after it dies is conditional. But given the fact that there are almost no non-knight creatures in this deck, it shouldn't be too difficult for you to get a little extra value from Venerable Knight when it dies. Next up, still in the one drops, we have Weasel Back Red Cap. You get a 1 1 for 1 red. It's a Goblin Knight creature with pay 1, 1 red. It gets plus 2, plus 0 until the end of turn. So, yeah, a 1 1 for 1 is no scream in hell, but given the fact that it has that fire breathing ability to give itself more power if you want to pump more mana into it, that can actually make this more useful than you may think. However, if you do like this creature, and I definitely like the artwork on this creature for sure, Unfortunately, there's only one copy of it in your deck, so chances are you may not see it very often during a game. Jumping now from one drops to two drops, we have Inspiring Veteran. For a red and a white, you get a 2-2 Human Knight with other knights you control get plus one, plus one. Now, whenever you're running a tribal deck, it's always nice to have a Lord-type creature like this, which pumps up the other creatures of the same type. So most of the time, you're not really going to be swinging in with these veterans. However, you do want to get them on the battlefield if you can, as early as you can, because it's really going to start pumping up your other creatures without you having to spend any extra mana to do so. On the downside, though, there are only two copies of this in the deck, but it still gives you a okay chance of getting this in your hand early on. Now, the next two drop we have is Youthful Knight. For one and one white, you get a 2-1 Human Knight with First Strike. So yeah, this is slightly better than vanilla because of the first strike. Granted, its low toughness makes it very susceptible to most non-combat damage, but when it does come to combat, you really only have to worry about the attack power of a creature with first strike. And again, there are so many ways in this deck to pump up your creature's power that a lot of the times a creature like this is going to get a favorable swing in during combat. So granted, it is not the most powerful creature in the deck, but it will have its uses for sure. And I do kind of wish they'd put more than just two copies of it in the deck. Speaking of cards, which I wish they put more copies of in the deck, we have Acclaimed Contender. It's the first three drop we've seen. For two and one white, you get a 3-3 Human Knight. When Acclaimed Contender enters the battlefield, if you control another knight, look at the top five cards of your library. You may reveal a knight, aura, equipment, or a legendary artifact card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So this, as I mentioned before, is the only thing you have which comes close to being extra card draw. It is dependent on the fact that you have a knight on the battlefield, but again, that's not going to be difficult given the deck you're playing. So yeah, overall, I think this is a great card. It is one of the few rare cards in the deck, so of course it's going to have a little bit more use to it than some of the other cards. And also just the fact that it's a 3-3 three, three for 3 means it could actually have some usefulness as an attacker as well too, once its regular effect has been used up on entry. 
Next up, we have another three drop, and I'm going to try not to sound as annoyed as I feel when I see this card. We've got Knight of the Keep. For two and one white, you get a 3-2 Human Knight, and that is it. Now, one of the things I really liked about the 2020 Core Set Planeswalker decks is that they seem to do away with adding a bunch of useless vanilla creatures to the decks. I thought that was going to be a trend in the future. Sadly, it's not. Now, granted, this is a knight creature, so it does have usefulness that way, but there are other knight creatures which I would much rather have in this deck. For example, I would rather have two extra copies of Youthful Knight than have these two copies of Knight of the Keep. Anyways, there's not really much else to say about this card other than, once again, the fact that it annoys me it's in the deck, so we're just going to move on to the next card. And that card is Prized Griffin. For four and one white, you get a 3-4 Griffin with flying. So this has the distinction of being one of the few non-knight creatures in the deck, other than that, there's not really anything special about it. Granted, the 3-4 body means it can be a decent attacker since it has flying, and it can also be used as an okay blocker as well too. But overall, once again, I'm not sure why they decided to include this card into the deck when there are so many other knight-type creatures in Thrones of Eldraine, but there you have it, folks. And at this point, we get to move on to a new type of card. It is the Adventure Creature Cards. And I'm super excited about this because I really, really like this new mechanic they've come up with. So Giant Killer costs one white, and it's a 1-2 Human Peasant. You can pay one and one white and tap it to tap target creature. However, it also has the Adventure Chop Down. So for two and one white, you can destroy target creature with power four or greater. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with how Adventure Cards work, let me explain. While this is in your hand, you have two basic ways of taking advantage of it. First, if you want, you can simply cast it as a creature. So in this case, you pay one white and you get a 1-2 creature that can tap down other creatures on the battlefield. Once you do that, however, you can no longer take advantage of the adventure aspect of the card. However, while it's in your hand, if you decide to cast the adventure aspect of it, the effect goes off and then the card goes into exile. Then while it's in exile, you have the option of casting just the regular creature cost to get the creature on the board. So you see, in the end, you can take advantage of both parts of the card, but you have to do it in that order first. So there you go. Hopefully that sort of explains it for you. If not, I believe Wizards has produced a video which explains this rule a little bit more thoroughly, but still, hopefully that gave you a basic idea as to how to use one of these cards. Okay, so now that we've gone over all that, let's talk about the card itself. First of all, having a 1-2 creature that can tap down other creatures is pretty good, especially in this deck where you want a bunch of smaller creatures to be able to swing in unhindered by blockers. And then of course there is the instant speed destroy target creature with power 4 greater part of the card, which could be really useful to take one of your opponent's bigger creatures off the board. Now normally I wouldn't really want to run conditional removal like that in a deck. However, the versatility of this card is great, because if your opponent doesn't have any creatures that are power 4 or more, you can simply cast this as the giant killer, get the 1-2 on the board and start tapping down the other creatures that they do have. And that's what I really like about this adventure mechanic. It gives you a certain amount of versatility. You can choose one option or you can choose the other, or you can even get a chance to do both of them. Essentially, it lowers the chances that this particular card is gonna go to waste in your deck one way or the other. Now, keep in mind, not all adventure cards are gonna have this much use to it. Some of them are gonna be a little bit weaker than others. This is a rare card. You only get one copy of it in the deck. So let's move on to the next adventure we have in the deck so I can show you what I mean. Here we have Rim Rock Knight. For one and one red, you get a 3-1 Dwarf Knight. Rimrock Knight can't block. The adventure is an instant, and it's Boulder Rush. For one red, target creature gets plus two, plus zero, until the end of turn. So, much like with Giant Killer, there are two sides of this card. Both of them can have their sort of uses as either a creature or a spell. However, this isn't necessarily quite as useful as the Giant Killer, and that's because this is a more scaled-down version of one of the adventures. Still, it could have its uses, especially if you're able to cast the Boulder Rush part on one of your creatures that have First Strike. However, even if you get this in your hand early and you don't have other creatures to use the Boulder Rush ability on, just getting a 3-1 on the board in the second turn of the game could be quite useful, even if it can't block, because this is not the type of creature you're going to block with anyways. No, with Rimrock here, you just want to get him on the battlefield as quickly as possible and start swinging in as often as possible until he's killed. But the great thing about this card is that if you do draw it late in the game, it is going to have a little bit more use for you than just a regular 1-3 for 2. Alrighty, next up we have a 3-drop adventure. It is Arden Vale Tactician. For 1 and 2 white, you get a 2-3 Flying Human Knight. It also has Dizzying Swoop. It's an adventure, and it's an instant tap up to two target creatures. So a 2-3 flyer for three isn't bad. It's not the greatest, but it's also not the worst. Now the dizzying swoop part of this could be interesting, especially later in the game when maybe your attacks aren't going as well and you really need to be able to sneak in that last little bit of damage to put your opponent away. So again, like with a lot of adventure cards, neither side is overly impressive, but the versatility it gives you more than makes up for the weakness of either part of the card. 
However, that is it for your adventure card. So let's move on to the non-creature, non-adventure cards in the deck. And we're going to start things off with two copies of Joust. For one and one red, you get a sorcery. Choose target creature you control and target creature you don't control. The creature you control gets plus two, plus one until the end of turn if it's a knight. Then those creatures fight each other. So Joust is one of the two bits of removal that you have in this deck. Now, chances are you're going to be able to get that extra effect off because once again, almost all the creatures in your deck are knights. The downside is though, it will still have to fight the creature that you were targeting with this, which means it's probably going to die because a lot of the creatures in your deck do not have that much toughness to begin with. Still, a lot of the times this could still be favorable to you because it means you might be throwing away a much smaller creature to take out a much larger creature and clear the way for your other attackers. Next up, we have the second bit of removal in this deck. It's three copies of Scorching Dragonfire. It's also one in one red. This time it's an instant though, and Scorching Dragonfire deals three damage to target creature or planeswalker. If that creature or planeswalker would die this turn, exile it instead. So even though Joust is a bit more on flavor with this deck, I do like this a bit better as removal. Granted, it's not unconditional removal, it's only going to deal 3 damage, but it is going to exile whatever it kills. And keep in mind, it does say creature or planeswalker, which means that if you're targeting your opponent's planeswalker and you destroy it and you're playing against another planeswalker deck planeswalker, they no longer can use their tutor card to get their planeswalker back because it's been exiled and not put in the graveyard. However, even if you're not going to use this on a Planeswalker, you can still use this on a lot of different creatures and it's instant speed, which means you can do it and surprise your opponent and get in a really good block or a really good attack that you wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. And finally, we have the last non-creature, non-adventure, non-land card in the deck, and it is Weapon Rack. For four mana, you get an artifact. Weapon Rack enters the battlefield with three plus one plus one counters on it. Tap it, move a plus one plus one counter from Weapon Rack onto target creature. Activate this ability only any time you could cast a sorcery. So yes, unfortunately you can't do this at instant speed, but you can do it the turn it comes in because this is not a creature, it's just an artifact, which means you can tap it the turn it comes into play. So it can come into play and you can immediately put a plus one plus one counter on one of your creatures. So this can be useful with pretty much any of your creatures, but can be especially useful with some of the creatures that have first strike because those creatures typically have favorable matchups in combat to begin with. But if you can start pumping them up even more, you're looking at way better chances to swing in and not get blocked. Now, once again, this card, much like with Joust, is very on flavor, I think, with this deck because it's a weapon rack and knights, of course, use weapons, but it's not the best card in the world. It's not the worst card in the world, but it's not the best card in the world because once this runs out of counters, that's all it's going to be, just a regular artifact that does nothing on the battlefield. Still, maybe a little bit later in the game when there's a bit of a stall going on and you need to pump up some of your creatures, but you need to do it permanently, this could end up being quite useful. Anyways, that is it for all the non-land cards in the deck. So quickly, let's just go over the land base in this deck. And that includes four copies of Windscarred Crag, which is a land that comes into play, gives you one life, and you can tap it for either red or white. And then you just have basic lands from here on out. And those basic lands are 11 plains and 10 mountains for a grand total of 25 land, which is way too much land for a deck like this. But still, that's pretty typical with Planeswalker decks. And there you have it, folks. That's every card in the deck from your Planeswalker all the way down to the basic lands. Now, before I give you my final thoughts in the deck, we've got one last order of business, and that is to crack open these two packs of Throne of Eldraine. Okay, so here we go. Pack number one. I'm going to read off each of the cards. I'm only going to fully read off the rare card, but I'm going to read off each of the cards because there's only two packs that come with this product. So we have Red Cap Raiders as our first card. Reaper of Night, one of the new adventure cards. Scorching Dragonfire. Ginger Brute, <laughs> I love the artwork in this card. Moonlit Scavengers, Bartered Cow, Blow Your House Down, which is <laughs> such an interesting name for a card. I love the theme, the, the sort of, I, was, I wasn't completely sold on the fairy tale theme of this deck, or deck, on the fairy tale theme of this set until uh, I saw a lot of the preview cards and then I'm, I'm pretty much fully on board now. So we have Idyllic Grange, Wildwood Tracker, so tiny. All that glitters is our first uncommon, followed by Shine Chaser, Sir Allen the Lion's Claw, and our rare card from this first pack is Acclaimed Contender. For two and one white, you get a 3-3 three, three Human Knight, and when Acclaimed Contender enters the battlefield, if you control another knight, look at the top five cards of your library. You may reveal a knight, aura, equipment, or legendary artifact card from among them, put it into your hand, put the rest in the bottom of your library in a random order. This is actually one of the cards that is in this very deck, so... I mean, unfortunately, I can use this to augment the deck if I want, but uh, I was kind of hoping to see something a bit different, but still, that's no problem. We've got a mountain as our land, and we have a mouse token. Nice. Very nice. And... Just an advertisement on the back. 
Okay, so on to the second and final pack from this Plains Walker deck box. Starting off, we have Lockthwain Paladin. Now, there's been a couple cards with this in it, and I think that's how you pronounce it. It's Lo Lockthwain. If not, oh well. Weaselback Redcap. I love this. Any creature that can ride the back of a weasel into battle, I'm all on board with it. Ardenvale Tactician. Lash of Thorns. Silver Flame Squire. Prophet of the Peak. Eye Collector. Rose Thorn, the Rose Thorn Acolyte, Tomb Raider, Lonesome Unicorn, and our first uncommon is Lucky Clover, followed by Burning Yard Trainer. Our final uncommon before the rare is Kenrith's Trans. Ugh. Let me try that one again. Kenrith's Transformation did not roll off my tongue well. And then our rare card is Feasting Troll King. For two and four green, you get a 7-6 Troll Noble. It is vigilant and it has trample. And when it enters the battlefield, if you cast this from your hand, create three food tokens. Sacrifice three food tokens. Return Feasting Troll King from the graveyard to the battlefield. Activate this ability only during your turn. So yes, definitely sounds like a difficult to get rid of creature. And it's very green. I mean, the cost is ridiculous. The size is ridiculous and also has some nice abilities with it. So yeah, very, very green style creature. We've got a plains as our land, and then we have the on an adventure sort of token holder type thing or card holder type thing. It's, it's, it's sort of a token, but it's not quite a token. Oh, by the way, for you token fans out there or anyone who's looking for some extra way to support the channel, we've got a token of the month club that we do through Patreon. What you can do is sign up to get one to 10 tokens that have been exclusively created for Brain Pulp TV sent right to your door each and every month. Each month there's new tokens and occasionally we even send out bonus tokens along with your order. We've been doing this for about a year and a half now and as you can see on the screen we produced a fairly wide range of tokens in that time. Anyways I thought I'd just offer that up as some food for thought however that is the end of my spiel and it is also the end of these packs of Throne of Eldraine. So now it's time for those final thoughts on the deck. The Rowan deck is a fairly solid Planeswalker deck, but far from being one of the best ones they've ever produced. However, since it does give you a solid base for some light tribal shenanigans, that also makes it fairly easy to tweak and upgrade without sacrificing the core idea behind it. One of the quickest and simplest ways to find inspiration when it comes to tweaking this deck is to look at the deck list for the upcoming Knight's Charge Brawl deck. That thing is chocked full of cards that will work wonders in a Knight Tribal deck. As for a couple of other ideas that you won't find in that deck, I'd suggest Throne of Eldraine's Circle of Loyalty, though that might be a bit on the pricier side, at least until the prices from the new set start to settle a bit, as well as the Icon of Ancestry from M20. Not only is the Icon a great tribal card, but it could also help you a bit with the lack of card draw, which is kind of a problem in this deck. Something else that may help you with that card draw problem is to simply add extra copies of a card which is already in this deck, Acclaimed Contender. You might also consider putting in a couple copies of Cavaliers of both Dawn and Flame, though granted, in a two-color deck, cards that have casting costs that include triples like three red or three white might not always be the easiest to find the right mana for at the right time to cast them. It's tricky, but not impossible, though. That said, not unlike with the Circle of Loyalty, both of these cards might be on the pricier side for folks who are just looking to augment a Planeswalker deck. And finally, ignoring the tribal aspect altogether, a card like Outlaw's Merriment might be a fun addition as well. A lot of the times with an enchantment like this, you have to worry about giving up an entire turn to cast it, but given the low cost of your creatures, it's entirely possible for you to get both this and one of your knights on the battlefield on the same turn. Then, once it's on the battlefield, unless your opponent is running enchantment hate, you're going to get some extra value from it each and every upkeep afterwards. As for what cards you can get rid of in this deck to make way for the new ones, Knight of the Keep, Prized Griffin, and Weapon Rack are all easy cuts to make. You could even get rid of a couple lands, because 25 is way more than you need to run a deck that has so many cheap creatures in it. So to tally that up, including the land, that's two full play sets worth of cards you've now cleared space for, which can give you a lot of wiggle room for improvement. So yeah, overall, it's not a bad deck, again, for a Planeswalker deck, and I could see this being a nice introduction to the idea of tribal decks to a lot of newer or more casual players. And there you go, folks. That is the end of this opening slash overview. Now, keep an eye out for an upcoming episode of the Mana Cave where we will be pitting these two decks against one another. For those of you unfamiliar with the Mana Cave, that's a little show we do here on the channel where we play live paper magic and then have mini tournaments like our Planeswalker deck showdown series. As well as sort of a teaser to that upcoming episode, my buddy Travis and I might be jumping on Magic Arena later this week to battle it out with these decks. 
Now, granted, that won't be an official part of the Planeswalker deck showdown, but we just figured it would be a good way to sort of test out the decks a bit before we do the real thing live. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, or if you just want to let me know how your pre-release went or what you think of the new set, feel free to let me know in the comment section below. I always love hearing from you folks, and I really enjoy reading and responding to the comments. And now with all that said, take care, everyone. Have a wonderful day, night, morning, evening, whatever it is, wherever you are. May all your pulls be mythics, and I'll talk to you all again real soon.